This month's Where Did the Road Go is sponsored by six awesome individuals. Illuminati, Allison Cook, Super Inframan, 36 Dingo, Lindsay Trebet, and Michael Fritchie. If you want to become a patron, go to wheredidtheroadgo.com. Thank all of you for your generous support and enjoy the show. Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. Welcome to this edition of Where Did the Road Go? And tonight I have with me uh, Mr. Travis Watson. Hello, hello. Ren, back Coll- again. Ren Collier. <laughs> hey, everyone. And Vincent Trewell. Hey, glad to be here. So, uh, Travis, you're in, you're in the midst of writing your next book. Oh, yes. <laughs> and how is that I'm coming? Up my, I'm up to my armpits and alligators, and I'm, I'm down the rabbit hole completely. Uh, I just spent a, a little quality time this evening with uh, GNM Chiral's Apparitions book. Um, Colin Wilson and, and I have gotten to be good friends in the past couple of months. <laughs> and, um, you know, uh, discovered some, some, uh, writings about poltergeist and, uh, Rupert Matthews and, and, and so forth. And tying that all together with our favorite, uh, Harry monster has been quite the, the, uh, the, the ride. So, um, I've been having a good time with that. It's just, it's not going as fast as I would like, but they never do. <laughs> I, I, I feel that like with all this stuff, everything, like everything really is related to poltergeists. Uh, yeah. Well, it, it, poltergeist apparitions, you know, haunting stuff, uh, all kinds of, there's all kinds of crazy thing, uh, that you could, uh, you know, that, that you can tie in so much of this class B uh, Sasquatch stuff uh, into, um, you know, the, 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 the signs that people take as the presence of the Sasquatch when they haven't actually seen it. Um, and it just, it boggles my mind. Yeah. I mean, I, I knew in a sort of a general way that, you know, that I totally agreed with what you said, that if we took all this stuff that people were attributing to Sasquatch and stuck it into a house, it would be a poltergeist right, case. Right. And I just, I had no idea, you know, <laughs> after reading, uh, you know, Enfield and after reading the, uh, the black monk Pontrefoc case and, uh, you know, just, you know, Olive Hill out of, um, um, uh, William Roll's book, uh, just there's, there's all of this great information that ties so neatly into a lot of the stuff that people are seeing out in the woods. Yeah. Um, the yeah. only difference is that you have, uh, um, you have a, a definite kind of a, a different flavor, I guess, with your wilderness poltergeist as opposed to your house poltergeist. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, but for instance, you know, you're talking about vocalizations and I don't want to, you know, go down the rabbit hole and leave everybody else, you know, kind of sitting here. But, um, you know, you're talking about vocalization. I was just reading Terrell today. Uh, it's one of the classics of, of psychical research, right? Um, talks about a, you know, one of the, the landmarks of, of Sasquatch stuff is, is vocalizations, right? He talks about a, a uh, ghost experience, an apparitional experience that some, that a landowner had after, his tenant committed suicide where he was aware of a presence outside of his house and he heard a scream that was so loud <laughs> that it literally, you know, I mean, it, it shook him to his very core. He describes being just, you know, practically wetting himself. Huh. Um, the really interesting thing about this, this scream though, is that his wife was sitting feet away from him and heard nothing. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so, Oh, uh, but you know, I mean, it's just, that's, and you go, go on and on and on and on and on. And, you know, again, you know, I don't want to monopolize the, the conversation, but well, there's just so much of uh, so much truth to this concept of there being this energy, whatever you want to call yeah. it out there. That's responsible for some of this stuff. And that and in that, Ireland, it'd be a banshee, right? Could be, um, in Ireland, 
you know, typically it would just be the she period. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, it, you know, but the, the, the guy, a, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say the guy hearing the sound of his wife, not hearing it makes me think of the stories of people seeing lights that you can only see from one perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like yeah, you can exactly. only hear it from one perspective. Right. Yeah. You can only hear it. The one person and not the other, or, you know, there's stories, uh, Sasquatch stories where, one person sees one thing and one person sees something else. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. One person sees a dark, you know, sort of squat, you know, uh, shaggy figure. And the other person sees one that's practically white, but it's dirty and they're in the same place. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in the one and only sighting that I actually had that happened. And mm -hmm. fortunately my wife was there and saw something too, but we right. saw somewhat different things. Right. So, I mean, that yeah, that that's a thing that happened. It's it's bizarre, but it it so, happened. So, what's your take on that? Why why do you, why do you think that is? Is it? I don't know. Maybe my mind couldn't handle seeing what she saw. She saw a a Sasquatch, a you know pretty classic uh, Bigfoot creature, and I saw a weird looking bear, and oh. maybe now this wasn't a scary encounter. This happened exactly once. But we did both see something, something huge, but it was running away from us. And we only saw it for a few seconds. And, you know, it was not traumatizing or terrifying. Now, if had it been coming at us, it would be a different story. <laughs> <laughs> you know? yeah. But I did not see a primate. She did. And she described it as looking like the um, one of the characters in the uh, current version of the Planet of the Apes, um, uh, mm. but very definitely a primate. And I huh. saw a bear, but not any kind of bear that, that actually exists because it was huge and it was multicolored. And that really isn't, you know, it didn't, there's no bear that matches that description. Was it bipedal? No. Well, that's the funny thing. It was going up a very steep hill. Oh, uh, okay. And so it was like struggling to get, it was kind of hopping up the hill. It looked like it ordinarily walks upright, but it had to get on all fours to kind of, hop its way up this quite steep embankment and get into the wooded area. Right. Yeah, it so, it's, sure. it's like, what, like what it was trying to get out of sight. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, like exactly. What a person will do when they're, we're going up a really, really steep angle. Exactly. Hmm. So, yeah. Interesting. <laughs> and, and it could be that neither of you saw what was actually there. And that's true. Yep. <laughs> I, I'm just glad she saw something too. Right. So I just wasn't losing my mind. You know, <laughs> Yeah, you know, you, you have that situation, I think, where, you know, you're perceiving something and your mind is trying to attach some meaning to it. Um, it's it's almost like a spirit communication, you know, where mediums describe, you know, they get these communications, but it takes, you know, it, it basically gets translated through their, um, you know, their brain, their thought processes, their, their experience, you know, and, you know, your experience may just not have been capable of coping with a Sasquatch, you know? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. or your you brain know. may just not have translated it that way. You know, you it's, may have perceived a particular energy and your brain translated it one way and your wife's brain translated it another way. Yes. I, I wonder what, like if there'd been a camera running, what it would have picked up, if anything. You know? Yeah, or if it would yeah, have just would stopped be, working, that would be interesting. <laughs> yeah. It would unlike, just shut down. Unlike Soraya, I don't have one of those cameras in my car. I probably should, but um, yeah, it'd be interesting to see what popped up. Yeah, those 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 are very useful. Uh, I've it undoubtedly be blurry. Though, where I know really wish. <laughs> I've I've read some stories where I really wish that the person had a dash cam. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Although I don't think I've caught anything paranormal on it. But uh, it's still interesting, nonetheless, sometimes to be like, what was that? Well, you had that weird man in black type That's of thing. That's true. There was, yeah, there was that thing. Um, Which is weird um, primarily because, like, it could be a real guy just riding a bicycle or whatever. Yes, but yeah. The, didn't you see him in a dream before you saw him in reality? Yes. Yes. <laughs> That's the okay, weird part. Okay, so you have to tell the story now. <laughs> I don't remember it enough. Uh, because that connected also to a dream Natalie had. Um, but there was a guy riding a scooter going toward Ithaca and he was leaving ghosts behind or something like that. And I've never seen anyone on a scooter in Ithaca, like ever. And it's, it was, uh, it was October, but it was still really hot out. 
And so as I was uh, driving to Ithaca, there's this guy completely bundled up in like a sweatshirt and a hood and everything else on a scooter on the side of the road. And so I drove by and went, dude, in a scooter. What the hell? Looking kind of like the Grim Reaper. Is yeah, that yeah, right? Yeah, a little bit. Because you couldn't see his face or anything. <laughs> and it, it was it was October, but it was still hot out. It was still like 90 degrees out. There's no reason anyone should be wearing that much clothes when it's 90 degrees out. And it was probably just some normal guy, but like the, I've never what? seen a scooter since. Well, and I've mentioned, I don't know if I've mentioned it on this show, but I've mentioned my similarly weird experience with an overdressed, way overdressed human being. Um, oh yeah. That this was in, it was on July 4th. I remember that because it was the 4th of July and we celebrated and hanging out with the neighbors and this man comes walking down. It was so hot. It was over a hundred degrees. It was so hot that I was wearing shorts and I never wear shorts. <laughs> so I had to dig up an old pair of swim trunks. This is extremely hot. And a lot of the young guys that are walking down the street aren't even wearing shirts. Okay. Right. We're in the city. Yeah. They're just nobody. It's really hot. And then out of nowhere, we're just sitting on the porch drinking a couple of beers. And out of nowhere, this person comes walking down the street and he's, I say walking, he's more like marching. He's like on a mission and he's tall and broad. Um, a black guy, he looked kind of like the late actor, uh, William Clark Duncan. Um, like he's a big dude and he's wearing this black military style fatigues and combat boots and a full length leather coat. And it's like, how is this person even like not passing out? Right. And I'm like, my first thought is, oh my God, he's got to have a assault rifle or a shotgun under that coat. Cause why would you wear this in this climate? Right. He pays right. absolutely no attention to us. Just walks right past looking straight ahead. And we just watch him walk past. And he just walks until we can't see him anymore. Now we lived in that area for quite a while. And we kind of, if I didn't know somebody, I at least, if I didn't know their name, I at least knew who I saw them regularly. It's very residential. Right. Never saw him before. Never saw him again. Like, what the hell was that? <laughs> I told my wife, we just saw a Terminator. Okay. <laughs> that, was, that was my first explanation. It was, it was crazy. It's like, it's not paranormal. I mean, a person could dress up like that sure, and walk sure. around, but what the hell? It's, it's like, still it's, weird. It's like out of place people. Yes. yes you know, the question is so. not, could they, but why would they? <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, on the subject of um, whether or not a camera would pick this stuff up, I honestly think that it wouldn't. Um, and the reason I think this, uh, I'm just going to read a real a quick thing from um, a group of three books, book called Philosophy, book three, uh, chapter 19, on the bodies of demons. And um, <clears throat> on the subject of the bodies of demons, the greatest and most recent theologians differ with philosophers. Indeed, Thomas affirms that all angels and evil demons are incorporeal, yet sometimes take bodies, which they soon leave. Dionysius steadfastly affirms in divine names that angels are incorporeal, yet Augustine and on Genesis thus asserted airy and fiery demons are said to be animals because they thrive with the nature of airy bodies. They do not decay by death because that element which prevails in them is more appropriate for acting than submitting. Um, so the idea is that these entities or spirits aren't really like made of matter, right? Matter that, that can be um, photographed, you know, in, in any way. Like they can be perceived, um, but they exist in a, in a sort of spiritual realm that a camera doesn't have, have like access to. Mm. Um, he goes on here to talk, though, about how uh, certain spirits do have like some they can be interacted with physically it's like however the the platonist and christian Sallust did not think that the nature of demons are without bodies yet he claimed that the bodies of angels and demons are not the same indeed his claim was that the angels are bodies of angels are all free from matter while demon bodies are material in a certain way he asserted that the bodies of demons are like those of shades and they would be like the human dead they are subject to past passions and they feel pain when they are struck or burned by fire into visible ashes a phenomenon recorded at length in tuscany although the body of demon of a body of a demon is a spiritual body it is capable of great sensation and can be touched although this body may be cut it comes together again and is restored like air and water yet at the same time it is hurt hence demons fear the sharpness of iron spears and swords thus in virgil the sibyl said to aeneas now go on your way and unsheath your sword but yeah, the idea that they're, it's almost like a, I was talking to somebody about this, say so they're not how it's, it's, uh, it reminds me a lot of, um, Keel and the, uh, ultra terrestrial thing, this idea that 
you've got these entities that, for whatever reason, exist outside of our reality, but can inhabit our reality by taking on like ad hoc created bodies, right? Or like taking raw matter from our world and inhabiting it for a short period of time until whatever energy powers that wears out and they fall apart. Hmm. Or they just choose to step back between. Oh, yeah, yeah. Choose to go back to. They disconnect. I mean, that, that that's similar to my theory that the reason so much of this stuff smells like sulfur is that it's a temporary construct that starts decaying immediately. Yeah. Yeah. The sulfur could be a, a an actual chemical byproduct of that transmutation process. Yeah. yeah I think Josh Cutchin would probably agree with you on that one. <laughs> I think I think it was his book that that made me think about that because if these you know because you see so many paranormal entities that just disappear you know Sasquatch whatever yeah. uh, any monsters that they tend to just stop existing and it, when he wrote the book on smells and he said uh, sulfur is the most common smell and it's the smell of decay I was like well that would make sense if these things were somehow temporarily created and immediately just start decaying rapidly and then they disappear. Mm-hmm. They can yeah, only sustain for so long. Fascinating theory, yes. Yeah, I've been having a good time with the whole concept of, you know, okay, so we're talking poltergeist, right? It's like there's all kinds of records of, of you know, ghosts and poltergeists and so forth leaving tracks. Yeah. <laughs> so oh, yeah. It's like, okay. It's another one of those, one of those things that, that – juxtaposes together to to make you think twice about what people are experiencing out in the woods yeah yeah uh, i was just listening like, to his impact timothy scratches okay. left on or bruises or that sort of thing mm-hmm. i was just listening to timothy renner today talk about the old-fashioned ghost hunting where they spread flour or dust on the floor yeah and then picked up footprints and so yeah but somehow they leave tracks yeah, and, and the uh, Hans Holzer has a story in, in his book, Ghosts, um, which is this massive compendium of, of his case studies, um, where that's exactly what happened. The family was experiencing a, a, a haunting. Um, in, in particular, they were hearing the sounds of basically the pitter-patter of little feet upstairs. Um, and, uh, you know, after considerable time, the, the, the wife decided that she was going to put down flour um, in, in one of the areas where they heard this all the time, just to prove to herself that there was something going on. She's, you know, I mean, cause you know, a lot of times when you're, people are dealing with these, uh, invisible entities, whatever they are, um, they're sure they're going crazy. Um, so put down flour long and short of it is there actually were small childlike tracks found in the flower, um, after she did this. So, yeah, yeah I mean, it happens. It's, and it is, it, it was, I remember, I know I've read in other, you know, ghost hunting blogs and things uh, uh, about uh, people doing that back in the day before we got all advanced and well, technological and I think they even, infrared and all that crap. <laughs> I, I, I think they even used that on some of the ghost hunting shows early on. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. They they tried to, to well, I mean, a lot, you know, ghost hunting derives from the psychical research stuff, yeah. so... Yeah, you know, if if they had any acquaintance at all with the old old style ghost hunters, I know that's one of the things that they they used to do. So yeah, I, I'm not sure how much our, our modern technology actually helps with this stuff. Yeah, I've been you know, watching. Uh, yeah, I don't have access to some of the more popular shows because up here in Canada, it's a little harder to get them. I'd have to. I'd have to do a VPN and, and ah. you know, fake being in North America <laughs> or being <laughs> in the United States um, to, to be able to, to subscribe to some of those channels. But some of the things that I watch on YouTube and stuff, it's like, uh, you know, we have all these pods and, and cameras and laser grids and all this yeah, stuff. Yeah. And you're basically talking about a being that's incorporeal. Um, I'm just not sure, you know, it, how much good that, that does, you know, how, how much of the, the readings that people are getting are actually ghosts and not some fly that flew through the grid or something. Yeah. I, 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 I will say, I two, gotta say, you probably haven't missed much to be very honest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the two elements, technological elements, I think that are, are pretty useful. Um, even still are like, I like spirit boxes. I don't think uh-huh. that they're necessarily ghost hunting equipment, but more, spirit communication equipment like i've used them in ritual setting uh to speak with spirits that have conjured 
uh, which works really well. Um, but also like a temperature, uh, using temperature as a gauge for mm. the presence of a spirit, I think is still pretty reliable because that yeah. goes back even to, you know, like a ceremonial sort of magic and evocation, like looking for temperature changes in the room is one of the signs that, you know, like that you've conjured the spirit properly. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. I, I absolutely agree with that. And, you know, it's just, I think that a lot of these shows have just gone completely overboard. though. <laughs> Oh yeah, well, I guess, uh, yeah. and taken the human element out of out of you know yeah. trying to uh, you know, find they, these spirits. They need eyeballs, and so they're going to you know do the most outrageous things possible to get attention. Right, and well, sure, sure. we make for good scientific inquiry. The, the I'm 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 unsure how I feel about spirit boxes, but the the thing that really blew my mind is when people were using. Uh, I think we saw them when we were in Gettysburg, and then I saw them somewhere else too, where they kept, were calling them portal boxes. And basically, they were the spirit box thing, but through, put through a reverb pedal with a lot of black lights on the box. <laughs> and I'm just like, this is even more useless than a spirit box, as far as I'm concerned, because now you're, you're getting you know, what could be communication now distorted through the pedal, but boy, does it sound creepy. Yeah, you know, you could probably make a good drone metal album that way. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I had a quick uh, follow-up question for Ren. Um, reference uh, what you were saying about demons and bodies. Mm-hmm. Uh, how would that relate to what I've just you know heard countless times that mm-hmm. demons wish to possess people so that they can experience the physical experiences enjoy the lust of the flesh are yeah. there different kinds of demons are there those that need to get into a body or are there you know other different types or how does that work well the, the demon i the demons i was referring to in, in that passage are the the in the greek sense the d a e n M-O-N, which is just pronounced demon. Uh, a lot of people like to say daemon or whatever, but it just de- it's just demon as well. Um, and I don't know. I mean, possession is a tricky topic because I don't think it's like impossible. Like, you know, it, there's definitely accounts of possession in the Bible, like the whole point of exorcism uh, in both in Christianity and in multiple other like esoteric traditions um, is to remove a spirit from someone. So, I do think it's possible, but motivation-wise, I really don't know. I mean, I, I've i speculated in the past that one of the reasons spirits like offerings um, is because it's like allowing them to experience things that they might have found pleasurable as a human. So like offering a spirit rum, you know, allows it to, to taste alcohol or that's why things like it's usually like things that are vices that are offered right so yes. fat and meats and cigars and tobacco and rum you know it's like things that that people would have enjoyed in, in life and um i guess i was thinking less of the involuntary possession mm-hmm. which i think is often very often mental illness yeah. and you know, that's a whole different topic but i was thinking of the voluntary possession like mm-hmm. where people I'll be blunt, like in Vudao, where mm-hmm. they let the spirit enter them and, as they say, ride them. And that what right. the spirit enjoys is that because it gets to have a body again and hungry ghosts. I mean, so. you could speculate that. Yeah. I mean, personally, I, I don't have much experience with ATRs or voodoo or anything, so I, I won't try to speak at length on it. It's just not like an area that I have a lot of expertise in. I've definitely heard stories like that, but it's also hard for me to separate the reality of it, which is a lot of times hidden behind an initiatory tradition that that isn't publicly known. And, you know, probably sensationalized accounts by ethnologists and anthropologists and tabloids. So it's it's difficult for me to parse it, really. But um, I certainly think it's something that's possible. I just don't know enough about it to really comment one way or the other. Yeah, I I get you. I was also just thinking of the idea that like vampires were corpses that were inhabited by a demon and made to walk around and do stuff. And Mm -hmm. you know, that that's been a fascinating concept to me. Yeah. Um, Yeah. The, the actual physical raising of the dead is something that shows up um, in several different places, both in 
Western magical tradition, um, but I mean, even in the Bible. So it's it's something that I've, I've wondered if, if it, it is indeed possible, though my sneaking suspicion is that something like a vampire, um, if it existed, was probably more spirit than it was like physically, uh, you know, an actual dead person, like an actual, you know, dead body that like was running around. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's per- pretty clearly a vampire tradition in places like Eastern Europe and so forth, but uh, uh, might uh, look at something like John Michael Greer's Monsters book, where he goes into mm-hmm. detail about vampires being basically uh, uh, an individual who has been caught between uh, the two deaths, you know, the, the death of the physical body and the death of the, or the dissolution of the etheric body. And that person has somehow learned um, to keep that uh, that ethereal, the etheric corpus um, together by grabbing energy from living people, which, you know, is very, uh, I mean, Greer says it is extraordinarily rare now, given the way that we dispose of, of bodies, because um, mm. you, you do need to have a, an intact body to come back to, apparently. Um, I, I found his discussion of that really, really interesting and, you know, something that, that, you know, could, could possibly be the case. You see something similar to that in, uh, uh, Dion Fortune's, uh, semi-fictional, uh, Secrets of Dr. Taverner. Uh, mm. She has a vampire story in there too. Uh, very similar circumstance. Um, so there's something there, but I, the point I'd like to make, uh, Vincent is, uh, you know, the Loa and demons are not the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I'm not. Uh, yeah, you're, well, you're, it depends uh, how you. I'm well, I mean, same thing either. depends on, depending <laughs> no, on I, your religious perspective, yeah, I guess. I would but, put uh, that up. No, the the, the folks that are involved in Vidal, um are are you know obviously um, very uh, attuned to their uh, to their spirits, and you know uh, I've known several people who were involved in the tradition and. Yeah, you know, to them, uh, being ridden by the Loa is 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 a privilege, um, and it's not something that uh, that they take on lightly. Um, it's something that they prepare intensively for uh, through a series of initiatic experiences, um, and you have to learn how to do it. <laughs> You know, it's not, uh, it's not, uh, you know, something you just, oh, hey, I think I'm going to get possessed by the Loa today. <laughs> uh, there's oh, a no. whole, there's a whole ritual set involved in, in how that happens. So it's very different in my mind from uh, the kind of uh, demonic possession that I think you might be thinking about. Um, no, I just yeah. that they're totally different things. Yeah, yeah. If, if I understand correctly, a lot of the Lua are spirits of the ancestors and they're not, no, they're not fallen angels in the Bible. They're yeah. the spirits of the ancestors. And yes, it's seen as a very positive thing. I don't yeah, put it there's in a, a negative light. No, there, there's a, there's a whole sector of, uh, of Vodun spirits called the, the Gede. Um, I think that's how it's pronounced. I'm not, I don't speak French, so, um, which are the spirits of the dead. And when they come in, they're usually pretty raunchy, uh, apparently. Uh, and, uh, you know, they they are very much about, you know, having a body and having a good time. Um, some of the higher Loa, uh, Papa Legba, for instance, or um, uh, Erzuli, uh, some, of the, some of the others. Um, well, they're basically you know, gods, it, right? It's, yeah, they're basically gods, yeah. <laughs> So if you're, you know, it's much like the kind of, um, to a, a greater degree, much like the kind of, of uh, uh, invocatory magic that you see in, you know, religions like Wicca, for instance, or you see, you know, the calling of God forms into people in, in ceremonial magic, too. Um, so, you know, it's just a, a kind of a different way of doing that. And, of course, Ren can talk more about that than, than I can, but it's certainly something that's, that is a possibility. Um, there is though, in my mind, you know, a certain very rare, um, uh, type of spirit, uh, that is basically, you know, not pleased with humanity and, uh, you know, exists to give us a hard time. <laughs> um, I don't know that I particularly think of them as fallen angels because they've, you know, there have been stories about them since ancient Babylon, um, you know, and it does seem that some of those beings 
have a thing for human bodies. But I think that, as you say, the vast majority of people who are talking about demonic possessions are talking about mental illness. Um, yeah. You know, well, I just know that there are, but there are those rare, there's rare circumstances where there may actually be some spiritual action happening as well. Who tends to get possessed tends to be uh, kids who grew up in a really religious family. And you don't have to be, you know, a Freudian psychologist to see that maybe that's part of their own personality that resents the fundamentalist religion that's being forced upon them. Sure. And, but they can't, as themselves, say the things that the demon says. So they develop a, like, second personality that just unloads on how much they hate all this religious crap. And that to me explains a lot of it without any actual demons. Sure. This is my take, you know, uh, and I, I would totally agree with, uh, with that. There's, there are certain psychoses, you know, certain mental illnesses that, you know, and, you know, as you say, that, that kind of split personality syndrome that could totally explain a lot of the things that we see. Um, you know, I, I but, don't know, but I just wonder, do people from secular uh, families who aren't religious ever get possessed? Does that ever happen? Because it seems like they're always from very religious families. Yeah, I think that's I could I couldn't answer that one. Brand, do you know? <laughs> well, I think that maybe more uh, religious families are able to correctly identify it. I think the inverse could also be true, and that you have cases of possession that uh, because they you know, exhibit themselves in a completely secular environment are just treated as mental illness. Right? I, I had a friend who, uh, I had a friend who worked in um, uh, mental health uh, some time ago, who uh, was also a, a, a satiric person. And um, he kept, uh, he called them demon traps. Uh, there were two, uh, Dravite is a, is a brown tourmaline. I think it comes from Australia. But uh, he had these two large chunks of tourmaline uh, next to his office door, um, one on each side of his office door that he had programmed to remove negative energies, negative entities, parasites, whatever the hell they were dragging with them. And he said it was remarkable. He'd have these people who were just, you know, very disturbed come through his door and all of a sudden be almost completely normal. Um, so there is something to that, that idea that there is a spiritual component to, say, mental illness, but that's not all of it either. Um, the, yeah. I think that, that what you have is a synchronous, a, synch, uh, synch, <laughs> a syncretic effect that, you know, the one exists and therefore the other exists or is drawn to it. So it, It's also worth keeping in mind, too, that um, on, on some level, it seems like full on supernatural possession is... Um, not the most advantageous strategy for, let's say, like a predatory spirit. Ideally, like a good hacker, you would want to be inside of the system and, and not be detected, mm -hmm. right? Feeding off whatever you want to feed off of without any noticing you're there, yeah. right? Um, and I think that that can happen uh, probably oh, yeah. frequently than dramatic uh, possessions. It's just people just carrying along effectively parasites Right, that are that are just sort of leeching off of them. That's something I hate about Hollywood. That if if somebody's possessed by the devil, they always look or is the offspring of the devil. They always look horrible and do all this disgusting stuff. If that really happened, they'd probably be beautiful and you know be very beguiling because that would be a lot more effective. You have to think, too, I mean, staying hidden would be of primary importance because, uh, frankly, exorcism isn't that difficult to do. Um, there are, I mean, you could do something like the headless rite that's like a potent exorcism. Like, assuming that you, you come into contact with someone who, who knows how to perform the exorcism, it's, it's, you know, not that difficult to do. So you'd want to stay hidden if you were, if you were a, like some sort of spiritual predator. That yeah, I mean, analogy's dead on, man. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, my friend who was a mentor to me for quite some time, who was also quite psychic um, back in my much, much, much younger days, um, said that, you know, you're talking about parasites, Ren. Um, he said one of the most common places to find parasites is, is bars, um, because you have people who are drinking to excess, who are basically damaging their auric field, which is the, the 
you know, the, the life force that surrounds you basically. Right. And uh, just providing open space for these predatory spirits, these parasites really that feed on, you know, depression and guilt and anger and all the things that you find in bars, uh, mm-hmm. you know, just provide open season for these things. You know, and they come and attach to alcoholic people and, you know, alcoholic people tend to be uh, depressive anyway. And so don't even notice that their energy is being sucked because um, mm-hmm. they just feel like crap all the time anyway. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's, it, it's an interesting um, it's an interesting study. And that, that same entity could be subtly encouraging them to uh, stay alcoholic as a way to keep their you know immune system effectively down and exactly. true. Yeah, that's something exactly. that Sophie McCarthy uh, she wrote. Not, I think it's the Exorcist's hand, the Exorcist Handbook. I think it's a really really good book. Um, pretty I'm breezy. Sorry. So who was that again, Ren? Uh, Josephine McCarthy. Oh yeah 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 yeah. And it's I read that recently, and that's something that she talks about as well, um, especially as an advice for exorcists. It's like if you're going to be doing exorcism, you kind of need to quit drinking alcohol. As just a defense mechanism for yourself. Hmm. Well, I, I noticed, you know, in, in my own life, many again, many moons ago, um, you know, distinct improvement in my uh, my native uh, mental state um, after you know giving up alcohol. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, I don't know whether to attribute that to to uh, the changes in in brain biochemistry or or spiritual or otherwise but uh, yeah it's maybe both yeah maybe both it's definitely something to consider a, a lot of people like to focus on the spiritual element of alcoholics anonymous but i honestly think that it's probably an advantageous thing to have in a program like that mm-hmm. yeah i mean i understand that there are some you know secular humanist types who get really offended by all that stuff but um, you know the whole concept of a higher power is, is so flexible in, in aa that uh you know, I, I I met people whose higher power was Ralph, uh, you know, the porcelain god that they worshipped when they got you know got hammered um, <laughs> for a while. Anyway, you know, uh, you know, for myself, I ended up. Uh, this it's basically what started me on on you know the esoteric journey, such um, a spiritual journey, um, and I ended up coming in contact with just the right people that I needed to meet at the particular time I needed to meet them and. Yeah, the rest, as they say, is history. But, <laughs> um, you know, it, it, that need for a higher power was one of the things that, uh, you know, got me going out into the, uh, you know, into the mountains of uh, around Arizona, around Phoenix, where, where I lived at the time. And, you know, spending some time, you know, chatting with uh, whatever higher power was out there. I had no name for it at that time, but mm-hmm. it was something that needed to happen. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, Ren, did you have any other comments about the whole like uh, the the all the other stuff we talked about in the middle there? <laughs> um, I, I did want to mention uh, looping back around to the idea of vampires. That um, one thing I wasn't I was super aware of until I started researching lycanthropy, uh, like last year, was that a, a lot of um, werewolf mythology and and folklore is almost impossible to distinguish from vampire folklore if you sort of uh, remove the word, right? Like the description of what actually happens is very similar. Mm. Uh, but the other interesting element to that was that uh, a lot of traditional werewolf folklore actually involved not le- involved a person not physically transforming into a wolf, but rather um, effectively when they go to sleep at night, they create a wolf in the wilderness that runs around and, and does you know horrible things and kills sheep and eats people. Um, but it's almost like a sort of out of body skinwalker idea, you know, mm-hmm. like that that the werewolf is a is a functionally like like spirit creature um and the other element too of the vampire thing is the whole idea of blood being important to to human shades to regain some degree of corporeal form um you see that in like uh, greek ancient greek necromancy where um in order to conjure a shade and have a conversation with it you have to make a sacrifice of blood to it so usually like you know an ox or something um, that's what Odysseus does in, in the Odyssey to speak to, um, I think, Tiresias. Uh, and in that, in the Odyssey, he has to sort of beat off um, other spirits with his sword um, to give 
uh, Teresius the chance to drink enough of the sacrificial blood uh, to take form. And I think that that idea goes back basically into antiquity that that blood is some sort of powerful medium uh, and maybe sort of a metaphorical reference to a sort of life force or something, but that these spiritual entities um, are able to feed on that and and gain the ability to uh, influence and interact with the gross world of matter through that. Hmm. All right. Yeah, I mean, talk, oh. talking about the shapeshifters and, and uh, the, the whole doing it while you're asleep, there's a story in Norse mythology about a fella who, Bogvi Bjarki or something along that line, I, I can't remember the exact name, but uh, uh, who was one of the primary warriors for his king. And uh, when his king went into battle, um, this huge bear would manifest and just wreak havoc on on the enemy ranks. And uh, one of the uh, one of the other other guys that was in this battle went running back to the village because they didn't see this this Bjarki fellow. Right, mm-hmm. went running back to the village and found him asleep in his uh, uh, in his his home. Right. So wake him up. He wakes him up. He's like, you've got to come. You've got to come. We're in this big battle. And he's like, ah, I was, I was there already. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and as soon yes. as they woke him up, the bear disappeared. Um, so not only did you have this person creating a bear form in a, a trance or sleep state, but the thing had physical effect in this world. Mm-hmm. You know, so you're talking about that whole idea of conjuration, bringing something to physical manifestation and, uh, you know, or, you know, the idea of, you know, Sasquatch or whatever coming across and decaying and smelling like sulfur. There you go. I wonder what the bear smelled like. Yeah. <laughs> but well, there were I, there were a lot of Vikings that found out the hard way what that bear <laughs> smelled like. I just had a recent conversation with a guy named Clay Van Diver, and he was talking about werewolf mythology. And in there it was a similar, very similar concept. That you don't create a wolf, but you come out of your body and you possess a wolf, like an actual wolf, but you take over its body and you do what you want to do. And then you return to your own body. And that seemed quite fascinating. And there was like a real wolf, like it was a regular wolf minding its own business. And you take control of its body and run amok and then go back to your own body. And that was the one interpretation of the werewolf belief system. Yeah. Well, there are certainly people in the in the modern witchcraft community that believe that they can actually ride along with an animal. Um, so um, I don't know if they go so far as to uh, you know it. Make, make the animal do stuff. But, you know, it's it's, it's still a, a thing in, in in modern magical lore. Hmm. All right. I sort of wonder the mechanisms of that. Like, I wonder if people have ever tried um, uh, doing that with like an octopus or something. Something <laughs> is completely different from human experience, right? Where or some animal that has you know eyes that face in different directions. Like, what does that even look like? True. Yeah, I know that. You know, I know that most of the, the folks that I've read about have been doing mammalian uh, species, but uh, is this a castaneda? I think it's Castaneda who, um, you know, and again, big question mark on that one. I, yeah. I, 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 you know, but there's, there is the description of him uh, shape shifting into a raven and, and can't figure out what the hell is going on because his vision's just gone completely wonky and it's going in two directions. Mm-hmm. And I imagine that's kind of how it would be if you tried to, to do something like an octopus or, uh, um, you know, it, it even you know, like a bovine that has eyes that set more to the sides, deer or whatever. But not not only uh, that, but other other animals see differently. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. At the same time, it makes a lot more sense to me that you would your soul or whatever come your ethereal body or what have you, whatever comes out of your body and takes over the body of an animal. That makes a lot more sense than actually shape shifting, <laughs> which would be so difficult to imagine the physics involved there like where's yeah. the hair come from you know how do you change this into that that doesn't really well, work uh, reality I mean, the reality. power outlay for that would be just ridiculous but if reality is yeah. an illusion you know 
true. Well, but that was the thing I, I noticed a lot in the folklore was that actual stories of actual shape shifting, like the person physically becoming an animal or whatever, were very rare comparatively. Mm-hmm. Almost all the stories were the person was in a trance state and a wolf appeared somewhere and that they're connected to it somehow, but that, yeah, they don't physically become the animal. That probably comes more from the universal monster movies. I'm <laughs> guessing. <laughs> well, no, actually <laughs> going back to Norse mythology again, uh, you actually do have uh, uh, Siegfried and his son, I believe um, who, uh, get into a fight with a, a couple of bandits and kill them. And uh, these two guys have these wolf belts. Um, and when you put the belt on, you change it to a wolf. Um, and this was also a, a, a common staple in, in some of the werewolf trials and so forth later on in, in the Middle Ages where, uh, you know, Satan or the devil or whoever it is that, that these people are supposed to have gotten this power from um, or is supposed to have given them some kind of a token that that they put on that you know caused the physical transformation. Now, again, you know, are they actually physically transforming, or do they have a perception of having physically transformed? Mm. Um, yeah, you know, <laughs> that that is the question. I was reading something a while back in Fourteen Times, the UK publication, mm-hmm. and they were talking about. Oh, God, I want to say medieval, but I think it was the 1500s. I'm not sure if that's medieval or renaissance, but this guy who was put on trial for being a werewolf and but he was like God's werewolf and he Ah. like fought evil spirits and stuff. He's one of the Ben and Dottie. You're familiar with this then? Oh, yeah. (laughs) Because yeah. that was that was wow. a mind blower for me. I hadn't heard of that before. Yeah, that was an that's an incredible trial transcript. I've read that as well, and it's it's pretty amazing. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. indeed. Please. I've never. Uh, uh, I read Carlo, one, one article. You guys know about this. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, yeah, I think probably between Ren and I, we've probably read a lot of really weird stuff. <laughs> 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 And, uh, but, uh, yeah, no, the, it's, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the book. There's a, there's a whole book that's, that's, that revolves around the, that, that particular trial. It's, uh, Carlo Ginsburg and it's night something. Ren, do you know what I'm talking about? No, I've read that one. I, I read about the case in, uh, the Claude Lesko's Mysteries of the Werewolf, I think. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. know that one too. <laughs> but yeah, that story's amazing because he's... You know, he's like, I was doing God's work for him as, um, I forget, was he like trying to do it so he could get into heaven or something? It's been a while since I read the the actual well, story. The one that I'm thinking of, they, they go out on a, a like a semi-regular basis, like twice a year, and and they have to battle the bad werewolves and uh, uh, in order to be sure that the, the harvest is night battles. It was called night battles. Mm. Yeah. Um, uh, so, it, it, the idea was, you know, as I said, that it, these Ben and Dottie, these these good werewolves, these the god God's werewolves, were actually uh, doing this battle against the evil, the I, the Mal and Dottie, I forget what they're called now. Uh, to and they go into battle with like uh, reeds or something, and um, they would fight and drive these guys off to ensure good harvest and to be sure that you know the village didn't starve and so forth. Um, but yeah, but he, he was very upfront about it in the trial. Yeah. It's like, yeah, yeah, I do this. You know, yeah. twice a year I go and, and assume my wolf form and go off and do this thing. You know? Wow. Yeah. I remember it having a sort of resonance with um, some of the stuff that Michael Berdio talks about. I, I think it's in uh, either out, I think it's in outer gateways Kenneth Brand's Outer Gateways, or maybe it's Seconds Fountain, I can't remember now, but there's a, a part where he talks about Bertio and the idea of uh, Bertio's mystery of the werewolf about how in order for the magician to fight monsters, like uh, this idea that they're, you know, these, these entities from uh, the Clipot who are sort of these trans saturnian monsters from beyond darkest Yugoth, uh, in order to do battle with them, the magician has to become a monster too, and specifically like a werewolf. 
mm. in order to fight against them. And when I read that old that you know that that account, I was like, oh, this is just like what Bertie is talking about. You know, Bertie is talking about it in sort of this modern ceremonial magic context, but it's kind of the same idea. Yeah. And it was like it's something that you know I, I think I've talked to on this show about my experience uh, several times through my life, where I would have an out of body experience or uh, and be confronted or attacked by something and you know become a werewolf to fight back against it um mm. it was like the first time i remember this happening was when i was a, a little kid and i me and my brother used to sleep in bunk beds and i was on the top bunk and i woke up one night and you know again i don't know if this was a dream or this really happened or what the deal was but i assume it was a dream or not a body experience but i woke up he was crying and i lean over the side of the bed and there's like classic gray alien like standing over him uh like staring at him and he's like upset and crying and i felt my child body like grow claws and hair and like i was turning into a little werewolf and I jumped off the bed onto it and started just like clawing at its face and like and uh, peeled off one of its eyes like a big sticker. And like inside of its head was like a star field. And I, that's I think that, that like shocked me awake at that point. Um, but it had another experience uh, several years ago now where I had a like a hag riding experience where I felt something get into bed with me. Uh, I was paralyzed and unable to move. Um, and I, I stood up, um, but I went out of body when I stood up and then had something jump on my back and ride me around the room. And when I was finally able to throw it off of me, I, in this, you know, out of body dream like state, felt myself become like a werewolf. And I like ate the thing that had been on my back, <laughs> just like devoured it. I and, love that one. Yeah. Cool. It's, it's like, you know, it's, I remember that happening and then I ended up reading that line, uh, of Kenneth Grant talking about Bertie as, you know, the magician must become the monster thing like a week later. And it like freaking me out pretty badly. <laughs> That's that not like a little synchronicity to make your day, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> The thing with Grant, the thing with Grant, of course, is that he throws in so much of the Lovecraft stuff, and it, it almost becomes fantasy after a while. Reading his stuff has a certain quality to it. Just, yeah. it just kind of makes you feel like you're going crazy. <laughs> hey, since you guys have heard of that, have you heard of the Eastern Orthodox saint who was a dog-headed man? Yeah, I think Christopher was supposed to be a son, kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah Christopher. Yeah. yeah, and that just seems to hang out there. Like, yeah, that's cool. That happens. <laughs> yeah. What? Yeah. what do you and, mean? and apparently, the, man, the, what does that mean? Apparently, the legend was that he came from a whole. He was like a, I don't know, an emissary from a whole island full of these folks. So, hmm. and they were very blasé about it. It's like, okay, yeah, whatever. Dog-headed people. <laughs> that happens. Yeah, like, oh, yeah, it's normal. <laughs> no, it's not normal. What? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, I, was, I was reading, like I said, I've been reading Aaron Deese's Texas Dog, Dogman tri Triangle, and I was like, dude, I know these places. <laughs> I mean, he's talking about Medina Lake. I actually lived there at one point, uh, you know, not, uh, not four or five miles from the lake, uh, just down uh, Park Road 37, which I think he references too. Um, you know, and, and there was stories in, uh, along the Pernalis River and places that I've actually been. So it was, it's, it was kind of old home week for me. <laughs> hmm. What what is book? What book is this? It's a uh, Aaron DC just published. It. It's a small town monsters publication, uh, uh, Texas dog man triangle. Uh, they've made a movie out of it too. Small town monsters made a movie out of it too. Oh, documentary. Okay. So yeah, I'm not familiar with that one. Yeah. No, it's a, it, I mean, you know, when you think dog man, you think Linda Godfrey, right? But sure. you know, I, since, uh, since she's passed, you know, uh, there hasn't been a whole lot of dog band stuff going on. But he just wrote this book about a, a series of sightings that uh, that happened in, in my old stomping grounds in Texas. So uh, he talks about Fredericksburg, for instance, which is a place I used to go to a, a state park just past Fredericksburg called Enchanted Rock. I spent a lot of time there. Haunted as hell. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, it was a battle site, so um, it was it, it was a, a residual haunting place, kind of like uh, a lot of what happens with Gettysburg. 
But, uh, yeah, I've, I've sat on the side of Enchanted Rock in the full moon and, and had some really interesting experiences. <laughs> so. Well, we got to take a quick break. We will be right back. Okay. All right, quick mid-show break here and a recommendation. So first of all, uh, anything you need, Where Did the Road Go related, can be found at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Uh, all the shows, back to the very, very first one, um, all the social media links, emails, etc. If you have a story you want to share, the link is on there, but you can email stories at wheredidtheroadgo.com. If you're into heavier music, especially if you want to check out stuff you're not going to hear elsewhere, you can check out my music show, The Last Exit for the Lost, and that is at thelastexit.org. There is a weekly show plus uh, archives that go way, way back. Lots of stuff there, more than you'll probably ever be able to listen to, honestly. But, um, yeah, we're, that's another weekly show, but it is mostly music with uh, breaks where we talk about interesting stuff in between. All right, recommendations. I'm going to go with another Pacific Northwest Stories podcast called Rabbits. And I think there's, there's two seasons, and there might be a, I believe there's a book. I haven't read the book. So the first season is very good. The second season, if I remember right, was also pretty good. It, uh, I think they're both sort of self-contained to some degree. It's been a while since I listened to them, but uh, they're easily as good as Tannis or the Black Tapes, which I've talked about previously. And I, I feel like there's more of an ending to them. They, it's a very weird concept. It's sort of an uh, augmented reality game type of type of thing. I, I don't really want to talk too much about it because it'll give it away. So uh, yeah, if you like, kind of, if you want to listen to a weird story. Check out Rabbits, and again, that's Pacific Northwest, uh, Pacific Northwest Stories or something like that. Pacific Northwest something. Um, yeah, and it's just, it's kind of cool. So there you go. Rabbits is my recommendation this week. And now, back to the show. You're listening to Where Did the Road Go? And I have Ren and Vincent Trewell and uh, Travis Watson. And Travis, you said you had weird experiences at that rock? Yeah, it was, um, I'm not, you know, I'm not clairvoyant, so I don't see things, but uh, you certainly have the experience in that place of the the energies moving around you and a lot of, uh, I mean, you can almost hear the battle um, that, that happened at that particular spot. Um, it just, you know, I mean, I'd like to say, oh, yes, there were ghosts everywhere. They were running all around. It's like, but I would be lying if I said that. So, <laughs> but yeah, there's definitely a very strong energetic field in that, in that place. And, and there's a lot of residual, you know, what people would call residual ghost energies uh, that, uh, you know, are left behind from that battle. It's, it's a, you know, it's kind of a giant stone tape. <laughs> As it is, it's a, it's a giant granite dome. Um, it's an old volcanic dome. Huh. <laughs> One of the um, regrets in my life is not meeting with Linda Godfrey while she was alive. Uh, yeah. I, you know, I mean, she really, you know, <laughs> did a lot of Beast of Bray Road, Dogman things. There is a woman on the Internet named Bettina Moss from Alabama who has done a lot of Dogman research, like a hmm, ton of it. Okay. And she's mostly on Facebook and uh, YouTube, but in a, and I'm not a co-signer. She speaks for herself, but she has some very interesting things out there. Cool. I'll have to, I'll have to look her up. And what do you guys think of dog man? Because <sighs> unlike, you know, unlike Sasquatch, which you could say, well, this creature could exist. Dog man doesn't seem like something that should naturally exist. No, I, you know, I, I have kind of the same you know, a lot of the same feelings about Dogman that I have about Sasquatch. It's like, except that I'm very doubtful that there's actually a, a physical uh, organic entity that, uh, that, that is the cause, that is the cause of some of these sightings. Cause I mean, we see Dogman appearing in people's bedrooms, you know, <laughs> and, yeah. you know, Godfrey describes, you know, there being the shaggy type that lives outdoors and eats roadkill and stuff like that. And then there are the ones that appear in your bedroom that, that bear a remarkable resemblance to Anubis. Um, you know, I just, I have to believe that there's some kind of a, uh, either people are, are responding to, uh, you know, geomagnetic energies and they're having visions of something or, you know, it's the, you know, it's a, it's a spiritual entity from the other side that comes through occasionally and, and manifests physically, 
I, I just, you know, I don't, I can't see Dogman being an actual thing, you yeah, know, like an actual animal. Um, I, mean, I suppose it's, why. yeah, I suppose it's possible that there are a few dogs that have, you know, it's one of the things that Dees talks about in this book is, and I think that's how he pronounced his name. I don't, I don't know for sure. It's spelled D E E S E. So, um, one of the things he talks about is that, you know, his, his wife, I think is a vet tech and, and he talked to somebody who was a, a, a veterinary person that describes dogs being able to, you know, assume, uh, a bipedal position if they're injured and, and unable to use those front paws. The thing is, though, that their hips degenerate rapidly right. uh, after doing that. Um, so, you know, I suppose it's possible that some people are seeing an actual dog that has assumed, you know, a, a bipedal stance because of injury or whatever, dog or wolf or coyote or something like that because of an injury. But I, I, I've got to think that that's the exception to the rule. I, I just, you have one of the things that stands out in, in dogman's or two of the things that stand out in dogman sightings are, you know, you have uh, uh, the silence that develops when these creatures are present. Um, and this is something that, that goes to like uh, Jenny Randall's and, and yeah. uh, the Oz effect, right? right? Where ambient noise just fades away when this, you know, this creature manifests itself. The other thing is the reaction that people have to this thing is almost universally terror. Um, mm. You know, it's, it's not even like Sasquatch where you have some, some people that, you know, have like a, oh, look, it's a, it's a Sasquatch in the woods kind of encounter where other people have very terrifying encounters. Almost universally with the dog, man. I, I know of one person um, who, who's had a dog man encounter uh, that didn't find the creature terrifying. Um, and in the book that I just got finished reading, everybody had the terror effect except for one person who was kind of blasé about it. Um, that to me is also a sign that, uh, you know, you're experiencing an energy that doesn't resonate well with your, with the human energy field, uh, that produces yeah. that terror effect. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I gotta think that the dogmen are more of a spiritual entity or, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, you can't even say it's the ghost of something because nothing like that's ever existed. Right. <laughs> you know? well, yeah. Um, unlike Sasquatch, which resembles great apes resembles primates that we know exist dog men could not evolve it, it wouldn't work like that and it's usually described as having not like the body of a injured dog but having yeah. a massive human body that's usually right. heavily muscled and like very tall and very strong looking and a canine head well, that mm-hmm. doesn't that doesn't evolve. Yeah. That yeah. can't even be genetically created. That doesn't no. Um, I get what you're saying. It doesn't work as a natural animal. No, um, it, it really some, doesn't. I, the only people, reason I bought up the injury thing is because it's possible that some people. Oh yeah, that, that would see sure something does that just weirded them out, and and they're like, "Holy crap, what is that?" And, and you know, in their minds, it, it it got a lot bigger than it was. It happened. <laughs> you know? Oh yeah. yeah, but yeah, I mean the people who are seeing these Anubis style, you know, dog men with the smooth black coats and stuff, it's like, no, I'm sorry, that's not something you're going to 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 develop naturally. Right. <laughs> that that came from somewhere else. <laughs> some some people yeah. have linked it to the Native American mounds, and that they yeah. seem to be guardians thereof. I mean, that's one theory that floats around out there. Well, it's certainly possible. I mean, you know, uh, Ren uh, can certainly talk about the the creation of, uh, you know, some people call them servitors, um, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, just a thought form. Um, I hate the word tulpa because, you know, it's it's actually a Tibetan word that refers to a very specific style of, of, of development and meditation. Uh, but Western magic has its thought forms and these things can be created and, uh, you know, can take particular forms and I'll let Ren take it from there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can, you, you can make a ghost. Um, and I mean, yeah, theoretically you could make something like that occur. Um, 
But I mean, I, I also, this is going to sound very skeptical of me, and I don't think this is the case all the time, but isn't it also possible, too, that these are costumes? It doesn't seem particularly difficult for somebody to make a costume in a, in a place that's dark already. It wouldn't be too difficult to make it look legitimate. Is it? Has anybody ever brought up that possibility that some of these might? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm I mean, it's sure one of the that things happened. that it's one of the things that Linda Godfrey talks about in, in her in her books is that yeah there's there is probably a certain percentage of these sightings particularly night sightings mm-hmm. um, that are you know some joker in a costume who's having a good time with somebody yeah. um, where you run into trouble with that theory though is you know people seeing these things in broad daylight um, yeah. and uh, the descriptions that people make of the way these creatures move, um, it's not something that a human being can do. <laughs> um, you know, because they're described as having legs, uh, sometimes having legs like a dog. Yeah, reversed. Um, yeah. yeah, with re- reversed uh, hacks and hackles or whatever they call those things, hawks. Um, I can't think of the word right now. Um, so, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that some joker has gone out and scared the crap out of somebody and, and created a dogman sighting, um, you know, around Halloween or whatever. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I think that there's enough, uh, you know, if you, you read the, the corpus of Linda Godfrey's work, there's so many of these freaking sightings that can't just be hoaxers. <laughs> It is it is interesting that the hoax angle because I think about that a lot uh, because near where I grew up um, there was a pretty famous cryptid hoax uh, called the Chocolaka Monster. Oh yeah, uh, are you familiar with the Chocolaka Monster? Uh, I've heard of it. I, I, Please, I'm not it. Yeah, yeah, go for it. It was just a guy with a cow skull and like a just like a fur coat or something. It was like some kind of like robe. And he was like jumping out at people on this sort of like rural dirt road that runs by this creek uh, near where I grew up. And he stopped doing it when people started forming hunting parties. And <laughs> like, yeah, shoot. I was going to say where I come from, if you did something like that, you might get plugged. <laughs> yeah, this is in Alabama. So he was he was taking a big risk doing it. Yeah. And he, he finally came clean. So no, that was just me. I was just messing around. But there's one lady who had, you know, a sighting of this, who I assume, you know, he was the thing that she saw, but she described it as like swooping down out of the air at her and everything oh. like this sort of dramatic um, story that she told and that she sticks to to this day. I, I don't know if she's still alive, but um yeah, it was something that could not have been possible for him to do. Um, yeah. But in her mind, at least the way she perceived that experience, it, it was far more supernatural than, than, you know, what should have occurred if it was just him standing by the road and like jumping out and scaring people. And there you have that whole idea of the thought form, something being formed by, you know, by all of the imagination and visualization and emotional energy. That, you know, it's entirely possible that she saw the Chakalaka monster that had been created by all of this, uh, you know, all of all of these people getting stirred up about this thing. That's right? what I was going to yep. say. Yeah. Yep. It's Slender Man all over again. Yeah. It's, Which uh, reminds me of Jim like Mosley not- and um, doing completely fake UFO stuff. And then generating people that <laughs> see your actual UFOs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that's what I was going to uh, reference was a story that Alan told me about mostly calling up this, uh, you know, sheriff's department and being like, yeah, there's this giant flying saucer over the dam. And the next day in the newspaper, there being a story about it uh, where there were multiple eyewitness reports uh, from people who were actually at the dam of the flying saucer being over the yeah, dam. Yeah. Yeah. You know, crop circles where you have people who are faking them and then you have things that are going like, wait a minute, (laughs) how did that happen? You know, you have people actually there when the thing forms and start to see the the outline occurring and stuff. So and and there's no human agency there. So it's just this is like something that I think magicians and occultists get more than most people. Um because anyone who's done like ceremonial magic or uh, in the Western magical tradition, but I'm sure in others, um, there is an element of like LARPing to it, you know? Oh, yeah. I wear an outfit. I, I have all these like funny tools in this like temple with all these like candles and stuff. Like, you know, it's like a whole dramatic production that you put on. Fake it until you make it. <laughs> yeah. And faking it to make it, basically. Like, yeah. You're, you're getting 
so into this that, like you said, you generate the uh, the thought form through basically like telling a story. It, I don't know. It reminds me of um. Sorry, I, I've like incorporated Archive eighty one stuff into my own personal cosmology of really? how this stuff works. Yeah, because like the idea that because it was funny, I actually ran across this in Agrippa. Uh, and I think it's in book two where he's talking about the construction of ritual and how it's important. Like, let's say you're doing a a ritual uh, for like a lunar mansion or something. Um, you're supposed to. There's like this whole uh, like an example. Examples in the Picatrix, but uh, you could create these on your own. Um, but the Orphic hymns are like an example of this, where you tell the story of the entity or the planet or whatever. Like you talk about the moon, you, you talk about all of the moon's different names, you talk about the moon's qualities, you talk about mythological cycles involving the moon. And it's almost like that act of storytelling. Like these entities are in some sense made of story. Like that 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 story is what like powers them in some sense and that uh imaginal energy generated by storytelling um is what they subsist on and are sometimes composed of mm, that's interesting yeah so, i've been running with that idea recently and i'm going to talk more about it at some point but I'm still it's still sort of rattling around in my brain when i was uh playing eternal darkness years ago on the gamecube they had a bunch of sigils and stuff in that game and i started using a couple of them and to, just to see if it would do anything and i had absolutely no results from it <laughs> <laughs> yeah well <laughs> yeah i'm actually working right now um on a, uh, a, a personal grimoire that exists solely on audio cassette tapes. I'm like oh. recording on cassette tapes. Oh, so like <laughs> lists of spells and, and records of experiments and stuff. So I'm basically just going to recreate season three of Archive 81. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, what is an Archive 81? Have I missed something here? It's a really terrible Netflix show, but an incredible ah. podcast that came out before the Netflix show. Everybody's like, if you look up anything about it, you're going to find stuff about the Netflix show. But it, the podcast is what I'm referring to. And it, it's like one of my, it's like a fiction podcast. So it's, oh, it's okay. But it's brilliant. Like radio. Yeah, it's uh, Sarai introduced me to it, and I, I was actually re-listening to it recently. And, and it's just, it's amazing. It's, it's really, really good. And, uh, especially hits if you're um, into magic or the occult, because there's like so many little things that, that sync up with uh, the actual experience of doing magic. And, and the funny thing is the people who create it are not into that stuff. Yeah. They, they say that <laughs> <laughs> they say that publicly, but uh, there's also things that they talk about that you would only know if you were really into this stuff. Yeah. It's hard to say. Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't hate the TV show. I hated it. I, it's, it's, I think it's gone off. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed it. I, it nowhere. It doesn't come close to the podcast, but I, it, it, I didn't even finish it because I got so frustrated by all the James Wan, like weird Christian stuff that he was like shoehorning into it. All the like Catholic guilt stuff. True, and, was, true. Like, <laughs> and I was like, Oh, come on. Like this is like so far removed from what the podcast is trying to do that. It just frustrated me. Hmm. Yeah. The, and the podcast has three seasons that are all entirely different. Yeah. They're very different from each other. So, and I thought they were going to do another season, but it sounds like now they're just done. That sucks. Well, I guess there was the left of the dial. There's like a sort of a short Mini radio. One, yeah. Well, there's yeah. a, there's, there's many seasons in between the sea. I think all the seasons, if I remember right. Yeah. yeah they're sort of like smaller like, mini ones. Yeah. That like, sucks if they're not going to do a season four though, because like, I mean, I guess it didn't really end on a cliffhanger or anything. I mean, all those plot threads get kind of wrapped up. It's not like there's anything left hanging, but True. that's just unfortunate. But, you know, it got the podcast numbers went through the roof when the TV show came out. Yeah. And so you What's, would think you would want to capitalize on that by doing another season. I, you know, one of the things about the TV show, I think that frustrates me the most is I was like looking up things about people who watched or listened to the podcast after watching the TV show first. And they were like, oh, this podcast is so boring. It's so amateurish. Like, really? Uh, nothing. Yeah. People were like people who seem to really enjoy the TV show uh, were uh, like absolutely hated the podcast, huh. which is completely opposite of my <laughs> of, of my opinions on this. Well, maybe it's like that. I mean, like someone will be like, oh, such and such is my favorite album by a band. And it's like their worst record. And then you're <laughs> yeah. like, why? Why that one? And they're like, because it's the first one I heard. Yeah. So, you know, to people who watch the TV show first, that's Archive 81 and they enjoyed it. And then they go to, to listen to the weirdness that is the podcast and they're like, yeah, I don't get it. You know? 
Yeah, yeah. This isn't this isn't what I remember. Yeah, it's it's, it's unfortunate. But yeah, Travis, definitely. If you if you enjoy like radio play fiction podcast type stuff, I, I can't recommend our really game. weird fiction. Yeah. <laughs> Really weird fiction. Okay, very, I'll have to check that out. Weird fiction with very in good my use of spare time. <laughs> weird fiction with really good use of audio. Mm, yeah, they use audio in some really creative ways, and the concepts in the in the show are just fantastic. Like first season's good, and then it gets great. Yeah, the first season's pretty short too. I mean, you yeah, could, it you could literally listen to it in a single day. It's maybe four hours total. Mm. So, and then the second season, the episodes get longer. Yeah. I almost honestly almost didn't listen to the second season. I, uh, like I started it and I'm like, wow, this, I think this is too weird. I don't know if I want to listen to it. And I left it for a while and then came back to it and was like, oh no, this is awesome. Why didn't I like this before? <laughs> yeah. I had the exact same experience. It took me a while. I started the second season and I was like, God, this is so totally different than the first. Yeah. I'm not sure if I enjoy this. And I, came back maybe six months later and started it again. And I was like, Oh no, actually this, this is awesome. So, <laughs> and I think you just, you need like kind of a break between the first and second, you yeah. know, you kind of have to give yourself a little break. And, and I feel like, um, it might be one of the only podcast story, like fiction podcasts I've listened to more than once. Yeah. Same for me too. Yeah. I listened to it going down to see Tim and PA at one point, uh, listened to it straight through all the way down. And by the time I got there, I just felt weird. <laughs> it's like what did that just do to my brain after listening to it for four and a half hours straight yeah good fiction will do that to you <laughs> oh yeah absolutely um and again they do a lot with audio too which plays into i mean it's an audio format but uh mm -hmm. I don't. I, I can't believe people said it was amateurish. Well, I mean, I, going back and listening to the first season recently, it is rough around the edges. But that's because it has like literally zero budget. Yeah. You know, it's it's just like a. It is an amateur project. At least it was at the start. Um, you know, I think they maybe had the Patreon going by the second season and could actually maybe have a bit more of a budget to work with. But, um, but even so, like I don't know. All the changes in the TV show, like making Melody, like straight washing Melody. Right, right. Like shoehorning in some kind of weird Dan Melody, like romance angle. Yeah, yeah. I really like, oh, God, this is awful. Well, you got to you gotta have that in there somewhere. Time travel into it. It was just like, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of curious where they meant to go with the second season. Because obviously, I mean, my thing was, how are you going to do the second season in a video yeah. format? And then it looks yeah. like they weren't even going to go there. They were just going to do something completely different. <laughs> yeah. If you were going to adapt any of them, you'd have to adapt the third because the third season is the only one that maybe is a little more adaptable. Yeah. Because um, the second one takes place in an other world. Yeah. Yeah. That's frequently described as indescribable. So yeah, right. <laughs> it doesn't <really> work visually. <laughs> hmm. Um, I was so yeah. Now that we've talked about this thing that only me and Soraya know about. <laughs> Sorry to leave you guys out of that. Oh, no, I've, I've actually seen the Netflix version. I didn't follow through on it, but I've got to check out the... Uh, I'm familiar with it. I just haven't listened to the podcast, but I, I probably have to do that. Oh, you yeah, definitely you have to uh, do that. I've spent too much time under a rock lately. <laughs> <laughs> with the poltergeists? With the poltergeists and ghosts and apparitions and Sasquatches and... <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of company under my rock. <laughs> so what, what, when, when are you aiming to get your book done by? Do you have, do you have a set idea? It's due November. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm still slogging along, but the, the thing is, once you get that first draft done, you know, after that, it's, it's basically taking the Emory boards to it. Yeah. At least for me. Um, you know, I know some people do major revisions in their second run through, but it's like, a usually I don't have time to do that. And B, mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's I you know I, I, things come together pretty well. So yeah, all right, good. Um, we're almost out of time here, uh, Travis. Where can people find all your books? Oh, Amazon! Look at the great Amazon machine, because um, all, all of my books are available both uh, as as Kindle and uh, and uh, you know uh, paperback. And uh, for those of you who have Kindle Unlimited, they're all available in Kindle Unlimited. So it's such a deal. <laughs> and it, and it's under W T Watson. That's correct. Yeah, I write under W T Watson, but everybody who knows me calls me Travis. So. <laughs> 
Uh, and Ren, where can people find you? So people can uh, find me at uh, liminalroom.com. I have a blog there that has links to uh, social media stuff as well as my Discord server. So if people want to chat with me on Discord, uh, they can reach me through there. Uh, and so I think, believe it's also got my email address too. So if you want to send me an email, um, we can also chat that way. All right. And, uh, Vincent, you have both a book and a podcast. That is correct. Yes. Thank you. Um, the book is cosmic collision. It is a novel. It's available on Amazon as a Kindle or paperback. Um, my main website is Vincent G- I'm sorry. Dot wordpress.com. Did you almost say e- GeoCities? No. Oh, okay. I almost said Gmail because my email <laughs> is VincentTreewell at gmail.com. <laughs> GeoCities is a little, little back in time. Yes, yeah, just a little. <laughs> no, it's VincentTreewell.wordpress.com. And yes, VincentTreewell at gmail.com if you want to email me. Okay. And I'm on Facebook. And the and, name uh, of your podcast? The, is the weird part with Vincent Treewell. All right. And you also do awesome recaps for this show. Thank you very much. Hey, my pleasure. Which both I and everyone else appreciate, as far as I can tell. Huh, thanks a bunch. <laughs> this one's going to be fun to recap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank thank all of you. Yeah, You're thanks more than more. welcome. Thanks hey, so much. More than welcome. Happy to be here. I want to give a big thank you here to everyone who supports this show by becoming a Patreon and I want to give a special shout out to those of you pledging $10 or more. Illuminati, Greg Ross, Leanne Cherry, Matt in Delaware, Allison Cook, Super Inframan, 36 Dingo, Matthew Sproul, Andrew Nichols, Christine, a blue second gen MR2 drifting around a Japanese mountain, Patricia Gaiaquinta, Alex Whitcomb, American Rambler, Andrew Maines, Ann Witowski, Barbara Fisher, Beverly Williamson, Big Boy Limina, Charles Davis, Charles in Florida, Land of the Crazy and Communicable, Chris, Chris Cicernos, Craig Parmenter, Diane B., Empty K., Eric Todd, History and Coffee, J., J. Otto Bullet, Jack Huntington, James Lindsay, Jim and Sophie, John Mattingly, John Bracken, Carla Mahoney, Kevin, Kevin Shrek, Cool Kitty, Kristen L., Laser Printer Jam, Lauren McLean, Linda, Linz Jackson K., Luke Osborne, MJ Armstrong, Mark Brady, Mr. Weird, Schmooples, Devourer of Mortal Souls, Oli Andre Olar, Paul Jeffries, Philosopher of Mirrors, Riker and Stark, Ron Dupre, Sam Sharon, Seed Person One, Stacy Sherwood, Tactical Therapist, Taylor Bell, Thunderboy, Tyler Glimstead, Varosh K, Vincent Trewell, Will Gebhard, Will Powell, Ren Collier, Annabelle Smith, Caroline Walker, TDT, Skunkworks, and Craig Sagastumi. Thank you all so very, very much for helping make this show possible. There will be a short Patreon segment from this conversation. Uh, kind of kind of informal at that, uh, because uh, we just ended up talking about a bunch of stuff, and I realized, hey, this actually would make for a good Patreon segment. So that'll be up later in the week for anyone who's a patron. If you want to become a patron, just go to wheredotheroadgo.com and click on the big Patreon link, and uh, it's only $3 a month, and you get extra content almost every week, sometimes more than once a week, and you get the shows a week early, and it really helps us out immensely. And I want to welcome a new patron this week, Daniela Scafati. Uh, welcome. And uh, one thing I do want to say is that Patreon charges the first of every month. So if you're thinking about becoming a patron, wait till after the first, because if you sign up at the end of the month, you get charged twice. Just uh, a heads up on that one. And I will see you all next time. You have been listening to Where Did the Road Go? This show is made possible in part from our Patreons, and we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this exploration of the strange. You can always find everything Where Did the Road Go related at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And thank you so much for your support.